All right, Engineers, in this video, we're going to talk about the vestibule. So again, if you guys haven't already seen it, please go watch either the anatomy of the inner ear first, then after that, go and watch the cochlea, okay? Because now what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the vestibule, and then in the next video, we'll talk about the semicircular canals, okay? So we're going to dive right into the vestibule. All right, so if you remember, we have, again, just a little bit of anatomy here. When we're looking at this crude diagram right here, we have three different parts, right? So over here, we've already talked about this part. This is the cochlea, okay? This is the one we talked about, the cochlear duct, the scale of vestibuli, the scale of tympani, all that good stuff. What we'll do in another video is we'll talk about these guys, the semi-circular canals. And we'll talk about specifically within the semicircular canals is what's called the semicircular ducts. And they have a specific area called the criste ampullaris. But for the portion of this video, we are going to be talking about this part here, which is called the vestibule. Okay, now the vestibule, we have to understand something here. Oh, we're missing an L. Vestibule. The vestibule is the outer bony part. So what do I mean by that? Let's, I want us to get a good concept here because this is really important that we really, really get this. So when we're talking about the vestibule, you have what's called the outer bony labyrinth, okay? This part is the vestibule. This is the one that's composed of a specific type of lymph. If you remember, it's called perilymph, which is what? Perilymph is rich in sodium, low in potassium. The outer bony labyrinth contains a neck structure. So it contains inside of it an inner membranous labyrinth. So it contains inside of it what's called the inner membranous labyrinth. And the inner membranous labyrinth is consisting of a specific type of structure. All right? Well, actually, two. One is called the saccule, and the other one is called the utricle, okay? So we have the saccule and the utricle. Now this one is actually going to be consisting of a, a fluid called endolymph. So this one has endolymph. We have to remember that. And endolymph, if you remember, is high in potassium, low in sodium content. Whereas over here, the vestibule, which was the outer bony labyrinth, is made up of what's called perilymph. And perilymph is low in potassium concentration and high in sodium concentration, which we say is very similar to composition of the cerebrospinal fluid. Now, the inner membranous labyrinth contains another specialized structure. This specialized structure is what we're going to be talking a lot about. It contains a special detector, let's call it. So we're going to call this last part here the special detector, or like a sensory epithelium, if you will. This special detector that we're going to talk about is called the maculae. Okay, we're going to talk about this one here called the maculae. Okay, so just so we understand this basic concept here, there's the outer bony part, which is the vestibule, made of perilymph. Inside of that, it contains this inner membranous labyrinth, which is filled with endolymph. That is the following, since we're going according here. Sac this is actually, this top one here is called utricle. Uh, one time, uh, some, one, of, one of the students I tutored had a really good way of remembering it. So you can think of utricle as uterus, and there's tubes connecting to the uterus. In the same way, there's tubes that are connecting to the utricle. It's a little one. If you don't like it, that's okay. You don't have to remember it. Then the one that's a little bit down from that is the saccule. And the saccule is connected to the cochlear duct down here. Okay. So we have two parts, utricle, saccule. This is the one that's rich in endolymph. Inside of the utricle and inside of the saccule is a special detector or a sensory epithelium called the Maculae. Okay, so now let's go ahead and dig in here into the utricle and the saccule because remember, we're saying that they actually consist of a special detector or sensory epithelium called the macula. So I'm going to look at these a little bit differently. Let's come up here and let's look at these a little bit differently. So let's say here, I'm going to kind of do this a little bit differently. Here's a box. Here's another one. We're going to connect the two like this, right? 
Okay, so just a little bit of orientation here. Let's say that this is the floor of the utricle, right? This is the floor of the utricle. On the floor of the utricle is a specialized epithelium, all right? The right here. That floor of the utricle. So this is, again, this is representing the utricle. And on the floor of the utricle, you have this specialized structure called the macula, okay? It's on the floor, okay? And the hair cells are pointing up from this point, all right? Then you come over, we do another box diagram here, okay? Here's another box like this. Here's another one like this. And again, we'll connect these points here. Okay, now, same concept here. We have another wall, if you will, right? This one over here in the back, okay? On the wall over here, let's just say that in this case, this is this wall over here, right? This wall over here, you're gonna have a sensory epithelium. So on the wall of the saccule, you'll have a sensory epithelium, or in this case, we're calling it the macula. And the hair cells will be pointing out towards you. This is important, I can't stress enough how important this is. So this is on the floor for the utricle with the hairs pointing up. The saccule, the sensory epithelium, is on the wall with the hairs pointing out. This is on the wall with hair cells pointing out. And this one is on the floor with hair cells. When I mean the hair cells, I'm talking specifically about their stereocilia with hair cells pointing up, okay? So again, I'm really specifically with this part here, I'm talking about the stereocilia. We want the stereocilia to be pointing up from the floor of the utricle, and we want the stereocilia to be pointing out from the wall of the saccule, okay? That is crucial. The reason why I'm stressing on this is the utricle specifically responds to different types of equilibrium, okay, or movements, if you will. So let's say that I want to linearly accelerate, okay? I want to linearly accelerate. This guy responds more specific to, specifically to linear acceleration in the horizontal plane, the horizontal axis, if you will. What do I mean by this? So, I'm in a car, and I'm, I'm actually driving the car, and then all of a sudden I stop. What happens to the movement of my head? It moves forward. So that linear acceleration and that horizontal or that X plane is going to be responding from the utricle. The utricle, the macula within the utricle is gonna to respond to that linear acceleration. And again, using it as an example, I'm driving the car, I'm accelerating, all of a sudden I stop the car, I decelerate, boom, my head moves forward. That's gonna activate the macula specifically within the utricle. Another example, because the hair cells are like this, they're pointing up, if I tilt my head to the side, what happens is it can also stimulate those hair cells. And I'll explain this whole mechanism. It's really cool how it works. But I want you to understand that it responds to two different types of stimuli. One of the stimuli is linear acceleration within the horizontal axis. The second one is going to be head tilt. So head tilts, okay? And again, just remember, when I'm talking about that, I'm talking about moving my head to the left, moving my head to the right, or nodding, all that different type of stuff, okay? I'll explain how this works. It's, it's really cool, I promise. Saccule, specifically, think about where the hairs are. They're pointing out, okay? So what if I linearly accelerate, but it's in the vertical direction, the vertical axis? So this one responds to linear acceleration too, but specifically, we could say vertical linear acceleration. And I, I don't know why, but this stuff is just so stinking cool, okay? But the whole basis of it is that you're accelerating upwards, it's moving the hair cells down. Or whenever you're decelerating, right, it moves the hairs up. And we'll explain this whole mechanism, I promise, it's really cool. All right, so now, making sure that we have this good, uh, good understanding before we start really digging into the structure here. 
We have an outer body labyrinth called the vestibule. It's made of perilymph. It contains within inside of it an inner membranous labyrinth filled with endolymph. That is the saccule and the utricle. Inside of the saccule and the utricle is a special detector called the maculae. Now, we said that the maculae within the utricle is situated on the floor of the utricle with the stereocilia pointing up. The maculae is situated within the wall of the saccule with the hair cells pointing out. The reason why this is important is because the utricle expands to linear accelerations within the horizontal plane and head tilting, whereas the saccule responds specifically to vertical acceleration, okay? And they also say they can respond to low frequency vibrations. This is kind of like a little one here, not as super important, but there is certain textbooks that say that it can respond to very low frequency vibrations, okay? low frequency vibrations. All right, so now what we're gonna do is, is we're gonna zoom in on this macula because we, in order for us to really understand how the utricle is being stimulated by linear acceleration, head tilt, and the saccule is being stimulated by vertical linear acceleration, we have to understand the structure first, okay? So let's come over here. All right, so what we have here is we have the nice basis of our macula. So on the bottom part here, you have these green cells. These green cells are called your supporting cells, okay? They're called the supporting cells, all right? Above that, you have these blue cells. These blue cells are important, okay? I'm going to talk about these brown cells in a second. But these blue cells, these are actually your hair cells. And there's actually two types, type 1 and type 2. That's Simple as that, right? Not too bad for that. We'll talk about the differences between the vestibular hair cells, type one and type two in a second. Now, these ones here, we're gonna mention them afterwards, like their function, but for right now, we'll introduce their name. These brown cells here are called the vestibular dark cells. They function in something specifically similar to the uh, stria vascularis. All right, then above this, you have this red jelly-like gelatinous membrane, which is rich in uh, mucopolysaccharides. This is called the otolithic membrane, okay? And then lodged into this gelatinous material or this otolithic membrane, you have these calcium carbonate crystals, all right? And these, these calcium carbonate crystals, they actually call these otoconia, or sometimes you might even hear them, there's many names for these. You also can hear them as otoliths, and sometimes people even call them stotoliths, but we'll stick right now to otoconia or otoliths. I might use them interchangeably, but realize that they do have multiple names. Okay, so now these otoliths, or these otoconia, or these stotoliths, what do we, what we call these actually specifically? What are they made up of? These are the ones that are made up of calcium carbonate crystals. These are important because their movement, they're, they're pretty heavy. They have a decent high specific gravity than, um, than the normal fluid within this actual vestibule, the endolymph. They have a pretty high specific gravity, so they shift a lot due to movements, linear acceleration, vertical acceleration, or head tilting. I'm getting somewhere with this. Okay, before we start talking about this, <clears throat> if you remember, we set up here this is going to be really rich in endolymph. Let's represent that with this kind of like teal color. All this out here is really, really an endolymph rich structure, right? This is all rich in endolymph. And again, what do we say endolymph was rich in? Rich in potassium, low in sodium content, right? Now there's a reason why. You see these cells right here? The vestibular dark cells? These are the ones very similar to the stria vascularis. Guess what they're secreting out through similar mechanisms as the stria vascularis? Potassium. So these are secreting out into this area this potassium. I just think that's so cool. So potassium is released out into this endolymph-like area and it's maintained through these structures here called the vestibular dark cells. Okay? All right, now... Let's think about this. Let's go to this, let's talk about the macula within the utricle for a second. Let's think about this. Let's say here, I draw a very crude, just generic diagram, okay? Here is the hair cells right here. 
right? Here's our hair cells. Boom, 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 boom. And then right here above it is going to be the otolithic membrane. And then a part of that otolithic membrane, again, is going to be the calcium carbonate crystals. All right, again, we're talking specifically about the utricle right now, okay? Let's say that we're taking that example that we had before, okay? Let's say here's your, 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 your linearly accelerating, right? So as you're linearly accelerating, you're driving, you're driving, you're driving, all of a sudden you hit the brakes. What happens to your head? It moves forward. As you move forward, what did I tell you was really special about these crystals, these calcium carbonate crystals? They're kind of heavy. What do you think they're gonna do? They're gonna pull this gelatinous membrane down or forward. So as you're, as you're actually stopping, your head is moving forward, the otoconia are pulling that gelatinous membrane down. As they're pulling that gelatinous membrane down, guess what it's doing to the hair cells? It's causing the hair cells to beat, to move. And if they move in the direction of their, remember this, stereocilia, the large stereocilia is called the kinocilium. If they beat towards the kinocilium, what happens? The channels open, potassium and calcium go in, and they're stimulated. So now, let's say here that you're driving and your head nods forward, right? What's going to happen now to the action potentials being sent by these actual structures? Let's say that here is the little neurons here, right? And it's coming out this way, sending action potentials. What's going to happen to the action potentials? It's going to be very, very high. It's tons and tons of action potentials are going to be sent down these axons, okay? And this is due to the head moving forward. Now, let's say that you're actually, before we even hit the brakes, right? We actually go from a stopping position and we accelerate. So we're in a stopped position and we accelerate. What happens to your head? It goes backward. So now let's do this. Here's the, again, the hair cells. I don't know why, but they're getting longer. <laughs> Here's the hair cells again. All right. And then again, above this is going to be the otolithic membrane. And then a component of the otolithic membrane is going to be the calcium carbonate crystals or the otoconia. If you all of a sudden accelerate, the otoconia are going to pull the otolithic membrane backwards. So your head, let's say that your head nods or moves backward. It'll actually pull the otolithic membrane backwards. What, that, what could that do? that actually could cause the kinocilium or the stereocilia to move away from the kinocilium. So for this one, the stereocilia was moving towards the kinocilium. Going backwards, the stereocilia could be moving away from the kinocilium. So what would you expect for this one, for the action potentials? You should expect pretty much very little action potentials being sent down this actual axon, if any. Okay, so this one will have very high action potentials, APs. This one will have pretty much little or no APs. Okay, there's a reason why I mention this because generally, whenever you're actually stationary, you're not moving, you're not linearly accelerating. Let's say that instead we take this example, you accelerate, your head goes backward. But then eventually after you know, the inertia and stuff like that, you start having a constant acceleration. As the acceleration is constant, your head's not moving now. You're moving in the same velocity. At that point in time, the otoconia aren't moving. So because the otoconia aren't moving, are you gonna be having any types of increase in action potentials or decreasing in action potentials? No. So when your head is stationary, there's, this is important, when the head is stationary, the action potentials are constant. Okay, this is important. So you're already, you're naturally producing action potentials at a very constant rate. But if all of a sudden you decelerate, your head moves forward, it could increase the action potentials by moving the stereocilia towards the kinocilium. Or if you're in a, a stop position and you accelerate, your head moves backwards. 
it could decrease the action potentials because now the stereocilia might be moving away from the kinocilium. Here's what I want you to understand because I don't want to say that just moving your head forward will actually stimulate all the hair cells. Not all the hair cells are stimulated. It depends upon the direction by which the stereocilia are moving. Because there's, there's some stereocilia that might move away from the kinocilium and some that might move towards the kinocilium. But for the most part, I just want you to get an idea that for the most part, if you're moving your head and it's actually stopping, your head moves forward, increasing the action potentials. We're assuming that the stereocilia is moving towards the kinocilium. If you actually accelerate from a stop position, your head will move backwards. That'll cause a decrease or no action potentials. And that's assuming that most of the stereocilia are moving away from the kinocilium. But if your head is stationary, you're at a constant acceleration, no change, right? There will be a constant amount of action potentials. That's what's really important. And the same thing would happen with the head tilts. So if I was tilting my head, what would happen? So imagine here, if I, like for example, you look at me here, right? Here's my, imagine right here is going to be my actual hair cells. Right here, right? They're pointing upwards like this. Here's my stereocilia. I turn my head. What happens to those calcium carbonate crystals? They move this way. And as they move this way, what could that do? It might actually cause the stereocilia to beat towards the kinocilium, increasing the action potentials. But then what happens if I come up? Then the actual, uh, the otoconia might pull in the opposite direction. Okay, and as the otoconia pull in the opposite direction, it might cause the stereocilia to move in towards the, a uh, move away from the kinocilium, which might actually cause very little action potentials. So I want you to understand something, that whenever we're linearly accelerating and we go from a stop position, the hair cells move back. If we're actually stopping all of a sudden, the hair cells move forward. If we're tilting our head, the actual otoconia will pull the otolithic membrane down. And if we're coming back up, it'll pull it up. That's the whole purpose here. Now, we take the same example without having to draw another diagram. We take the saccule. The saccule, the hair cells are oriented like this. Okay? So they're oriented like this. All of a sudden, here's my otolithic membrane right here, right? Here's my otolithic membrane and the, the crystals are over here. Let's say I'm in the elevator and all of a sudden the elevator just freaking takes off and I start flying upwards. The gravitational forces are going to do what to the otoconia? Pull them down. And as they pull them down, what will happen to the otolithic membrane? It'll move. And if it moves, let's say that the stereocilia beat towards the kinocilium. What happens to the action potentials? It should increase. But then let's say all of a sudden I actually stop, right? And as I stop, for whatever reason, the elevator starts freaking flying down. As I start flying down, now, due to the actual drag force, what's going to happen now? The otoconium might move up. And what might happen to the otolithic membrane? It might move up. So it might actually decrease the action potentials. The whole point is, for this whole concept here, is utricle responds to linear, acce linear acceleration and head tilting by moving that otolithic membrane. The saccule responds to vertical acceleration because by that vertical acceleration, we can move the otolithic membrane, all right? Overall concept though, to put it all and, and, and get it all here um, out in the open and remember here, let's go back to this. Remember I told you there was two types of vestibular hair cells? Well, generally they call this type one. This one's type one, this one's type two. The, the basic classification is that type one are more like bulbous, towards their end, like towards their basal lateral membrane, whereas the type two are more cylindrical. Also, they say type one has an afferent neurons that are more calyx-like, whereas this one is more boton-like or bulbous, like type of nerve terminal. So if you have a bulbous type of basal lateral membrane of the type one cell and a calyx-like afferent nerve terminal, that's type one. If it's a cylindrical hair cell with a boton-like uh, nerve terminal, this is type two. Either way. Remember, what did I say? Let's take, for example, stereocilia beat towards the kinocilium for whatever reason, whether it be due to head tilting, linear acceleration, vertical acceleration, what will happen? It'll do what to the tip, to the actual tip links? It might stretch them. As it stretches them, it opens up the channels. If you open up the channels, what type of ions will move into the cell? Potassium and calcium. 
as potassium ions and calcium ions begin to accumulate with inside of the cell, what happens to the inside of the cell? It becomes positive. As it becomes positive, what does this do to the inside of the cell? It causes the cell to depolarize. If it depolarizes, remember what that ion is, that important one here, calcium. Calcium is important because it helps to be able to fuse the synaptoproteins between this vesicle and the cell membrane. If this fuses, it releases these types of neurotransmitters out by exocytosis. What type of neurotransmitters? Well, the big one is glutamate. But you know there's another one that's also important here? And this is called aspartate. So there's another one called aspartate. This is also released. Okay, so there's two chemicals that are released at this actual nerve terminal. One is glutamate, and the other one is aspartate. So let's say now we take the opposite. Now the stereocilia are going to beat towards the, beat away from the kinocilium. So the stereocilia will beat away from the kinocilium for whatever reason. Maybe because of the head tilting, maybe because of linear acceleration, maybe because of the vertical acceleration, whatever it may be. The stereocilia move away from the kinocilium. What does that do to the tip links? It'll change the tip links to where it actually closes these actual channels. The tip links might become relaxed and the channels might close. Can potassium or calcium ions get in? No. And if they can't get into the cell, generally the cell will become slightly negative. It might even hyperpolarize. If it hyperpolarizes, are you going to be able to cause the fusion of these vesicles with the cell membrane? No. So this doesn't happen. Do you release any neurotransmitters out in this area like glutamate or uh, aspartic acid? No. What's going to happen to the action potentials? Pretty much none, right? Whereas over here, what's going to happen to the action potentials? You're going to have lots and lots of action potentials. And this ganglia is actually called the vestibular ganglion. If you remember from um, the cochlea, we had the spiral ganglion. Well, this one's called the vestibular ganglion. The peripheral processes are going out to the hair cells, and the central processes are going into the central nervous system. Another name for this ganglia is called Scarpa's ganglion. We'll talk about this more in the vestibular pathway. All right, engineers, so that pretty much covers the vestibule and all of its components. I really hope that it made sense. I really do. I hope that you guys enjoyed it. If you guys did, please hit that like button. Comment down in the comment section. I beg you guys, please subscribe. Go check out also our Facebook account, our Instagram, and even our Patreon. All right, engineers, as always, until next time.